Hello everyone and welcome to Live with Mary Reamer. This is What a Good Dog Live. This is the show that we do where you can have your actual questions answered by our favorite, favorite person in charge of dogs and that is Mary Reamer. Mary, say hello. Hello everybody. Thank you, Terry. Hope this finds everybody safe and well today. And we're gonna proceed here with your questions. Absolutely, we're gonna get right into it and please leave your comments because we will answer your questions live on the show. All right, here we go, starting it off. My husband and I have been working hard to implement consistent training with our puppy. Then our kids kind of undermine us by not taking it seriously. How do I train my kids to help train the puppy? Well, first let's, let's pat you and your husband on the back immediately. Great job. And kids are kids. So um, we find that doing different activities for kids than focused training is often a little bit more functional, should we say, and accomplishes different things. So a couple of things you can do. Number one, depending on the age of your kids, you can sit down together as a family and write down the words that you think are most important for your puppy to know and respond to. And then you need a definition for those words so that everybody's on the same page. Some people might say come, others might say here, some might say come here. Well, that for the puppy is like having to learn three different languages. So agree. And by the way, kids can opt out and say, this is too much for me, I don't wanna do it. In which case, you and your husband can come up with your own language and the kids don't know those words, just the two of you use them. A mentor of mine, Ian Dunbar, he had three cues um, that he taught his dogs with his family and he reserved words that were critical for himself uh, to use. So that's something you can think about. The other thing, of course, is that we'd like the kids to get involved and we'd like it to be fun for them. So tricks are great for kids to get involved with. Games, like you can do the ping pong game for recalls, as in coming when called, outside and inside. That can be fun for kids and the puppy. So you can do these kinds of things. Tricks, anything that's learning and connective is wonderful for puppies and for families. So, but save the critical language for yourselves. If, if the kids say, you know, we just can't, we're, we're just not gonna do that one. Fine, find something that they do feel comfortable doing. So think about those things, see if that helps. Okay, moving right along. Michael asks, our four-month-old puppy Murphy has been biting during play. He starts off doing well and play is not overly crazy, then it turns into an aggressive nipping bout. We usually just end it when this happens. Do you have any other suggestions? Great question. So at four months, we have teething going on. So there's a lot of oral orientation to things and then there is the stimulation effect of when we're playing games on top of that so i would anticipate that when it's going to happen and so if you said to me well mary we get 10 minutes of great play and then murphy sort of escalates and that's when the nipping happens fine go for eight minutes go for five minutes then on another day, go up to 11 minutes um, and try to build that way. Make the exercise different. So if it's a chasing game that gets him stimulated, go for a nice walk before you play. And, and I would use a word to teach him that that's the end of the game, but you want to stop it before he gets escalated like that. Okay, very nice. And also very nice. use soft toys. Be sure that you are using soft toys that feel good in his mouth. And you can teach him to go and find these toys like we were doing with the bully stick game uh, that went up. 
I think that will also, you will find that to be helpful as well. Okay, Mary. Kate asks, how do you handle a dog that barks, growls, and pulls toward other dogs aggressively on walks? Our one-year-old dog is very friendly at the dog park, but is very aggressive on walks. He gets walked three times a day and has been consistently since we got him as a pup. So somewhere along the line, there must have been a situation where he felt uncomfortable or threatened when he was being walked with the leash on. And some things that we have to keep in mind are this. It would, in our, in our day and age, we walk our dogs on leash and we tend to be walking straight towards the oncoming person walking their dog. This is a very unnatural approach for dogs. If we leave dogs to their own devices, which is why he probably navigates extremely well in the dog park, is number one, he has his autonomy. And number two, he would be meeting on the curve. Very, very, practically never would you see a straight on encounter. So from far away, dogs are communicating, okay, and sending, sending signals. And what I would believe is that at some point in his youth, he got some signals from a bigger adult dog that made him uncomfortable. And so his response to that is to have his best defense be an apparent offense. And that's the card he plays. Uh, so a couple of things. Take him for a walk with his breakfast or his dinner mixed in with some very, very good treats. Don't walk in straight lines walk in serpentines, walk in circles. You can also teach him a game called go hunt. So for instance, if you see another dog coming, just turn him to the side, throw some treats on the ground and tell him to go hunt and let him experience finding some good cookies. And that's what his association will be when he sees another dog coming. So there isn't the social pressure and then his response to the social pressure is to be reactive to that. So, and keep him by your side and lead with your core, okay? So that he can relax. Many, many times in these situations, as I say, it, it is a response that's been generated quite a while ago. And if we take a leadership role and encourage him to be by your side and you're standing upright and putting yourself in that leadership role. Your job is to tell him, my job is to keep you safe. Your job is to relax into this position and I'm going to pay you well for being there because I'm in charge here. And once he realizes that that's what can happen, he will relax and your relationship also will strengthen. Keep us posted on that. Okay. Excellent, excellent. Okay, another question. Terry, on that last one also, yeah. if she would like to send us a video, it is very hard for me to, I'm making generalizations and assumptions here, and, but I can't see the dog and I, I really need to see it to give very specific responses. But those are, uh, I do a lot of this work. And uh, this is, these are, again, as I say, generalizations that should be helpful. Okay, you, you heard that video, it'd be great. You heard that, guys. Please do us a favor and send in some of these videos so we can follow up with you and see how everybody's doing. And maybe on the next show, we will revisit a topic. All right, Murphy. Murphy sleeps in his crate at night for a few hours till two to 4 a.m. and then starts barking. We've tried to let him bark it out without much success and have started letting him go potty and then back into the crate. Should we just exercise him later in the day? What can we do about the barking? Okay, so four months old, 
Um, we have teething going on. We are also in a critical period of development called fears of knowns and unknowns. And puppies are soft and can be very needy at this time. So we do find that they will increase their water intake if not monitored at this age because their mouths hurt and they're trying to soothe it. And drinking more water will need, will turn into the need of having to go out more frequently. And sometimes there actually can be a regression in the house training. So a couple of things you can do. Number one is pull the water bowl up by six o'clock. Okay, number two, make flavored ice cubes. You can take some uh, low sodium beef bouillon or chicken bouillon and half water and make cubes of that. Most dogs love them. You can also in the summertime use a little cranberry juice or low sugar apple juice, half and half. Uh, number two, I'm not understanding whether he is sleeping in a bedroom, but there is significant research that indicates the uh, positive outcomes of what's called passive bonding that happens with having puppies and all dogs sleeping in a bedroom. So if he isn't sleeping in a bedroom, I might try to move him to one if that's convenient. Um, and if you can't do that, I'd move him up closer because this this will turn into very much of a practice ritual and it will be hard uh, to break and I, I my guess would be that if you just can move him upstairs and he has the feeling of being closer to his people he will relax and sleep through the night so let's try those things and see how it works out and let us know how you do uh, you also can cover the crate as well, that might make him feel a little more secure. Make sure that he can't pull the bedding into the crate. Um, so you have to construct a little lid on it so that he can't access that bedding. But that is also sometimes helpful and adds to the feeling of security, um, especially in this time, this critical time. So uh, cover the three sides and leave the front open, okay? Let's try those things. Let us know how you do. Okay, and just so everybody knows, uh, Facebook is throttling us a little bit, but if you stay with it, the feed w is working just fine. Uh, a question from Matt. How can we train Doug to take his treats more gently? He gets very excited and bites my entire hand when I try to give him one. Okay, so uh, we know Doug. And he is a charming golden retriever puppy and sweet, sweet, sweet. Uh, golden retrievers, along with many of the retrievers, retrievers just are um, in love with anything that's edible. And the quicker they can get it into themselves, the better. So they're avid about their food products. So a lot of times what we'll recommend is to put the treat in your hand and feed like a horse open palmed. If he goes to be grabby on your hand, simply close your hand and use a word to start with saying easy, gentle, whatever you want. Okay. If he doesn't, then close the hand, wait a little bit and then open the hand. Sometimes to get them with the idea, we'll put a little bit of peanut butter on your hand, the palm of your hand. So he gets the idea of licking. Okay, and then you can support that and tell him good, gentle, good, easy, whatever words you're using. So um, let's try that with him and see how it works. The other thing that I would do is when you're introducing this new concept to him, do use low value treats. Okay, don't get him too overstimulated with the high value yet. Wait till he learns and understands what you're asking for, and then you can move up to something a little more stimulating for him. Very nice. Okay, coming up next is we have a question from B. And she writes, our puppy is pulling on a leash and has a large prey drive. Uh, what do we do to curb these behaviors when trying to keep our social distance? 
Well, that's another one that I would really like to see. I don't know, uh, we don't have the age of that puppy, right? So again, I would go out with uh, some of the food, some of the meal mixed in with some very high value treats. Um, we teach two different gears of leash walking. One we call go sniff, which means you can have all the leash one rule, don't pull me. I like this for puppies because it gives them a little bit more sniffing room. And they're all about the environment, be it people or the ground. So this gives them that opportunity. And they're really too young to really be asked to walk um, in what we would call the with me position, which is by your side. However, that being said, we do reward by your side. So if we give the yes or good, when there's no pulling on the leash and they're walking nicely along, they'll come back and get that cookie at your side. If you get pulling, you stop and stand like a tree and there's no motion. And you wait until the leash is loose and then you can move on. So the puppy has gotten the idea that if it pulls hard enough, the human will come along. And what we need to do is to change that around and say, I'm not coming with a tight leash. Be sure that in the beginning stages that you give them the same amount of leash on the go sniff. Okay, if one person walks and gives six feet and another person only gives four, they can't learn when they're just starting. Ultimately, what we want them to understand is any time there's tightness on the leash, all forward movement will stop. And it won't matter whether the leash is two feet, four feet, or six feet, or 10 feet. Also in the beginning, don't use long leashes. The further the puppy is from you, the less control you have. That's earned, that length. So first they have to learn to, have to walk nicely on six feet, and then you can go to eight feet, and then you go back to six, make sure everything's still good there, and then you might jump to 10 um, when you get further down the line. But the idea of giving them a flexi lead or a long lead just because they're young and they have a lot of energy really won't be helpful to you in the big picture. So start with super treats, six foot leash, and think about that, those two delineations of leash walking, okay? While always rewarding by your side. Okay, the next one comes from John. Sadie won't come in unless she gets a reward. Did we create a problem and how do we solve this? Well, John, that's a game. Okay, and it's a good one, and Sadie's in charge. So um, I think that what I would be doing is I would still reward because there must be something about coming inside that she feels concerned about, and I would work on having different kinds of rewards. So I would build things like games for her when she comes inside. And it's the Sadie that I'm thinking of She's a very smart, um, active little girl. So I, if she has any association that coming inside might mean confinement, okay, and so uh, she might not choose to. So develop some games with her. Put her through her paces when she comes in. Do a find me game. Do a hide, hide treats game. And then start working on she's got to come in and do something and then the treat comes. Okay, so we're, we're gonna back chain it a little bit for her. Okay, but in the beginning for now, go ahead and start to use a word like inside. That means to come in. And as soon as she comes in, the other thing you can do is turn around and let her go back outside again. Okay, tell her how great she is, no treats. But if you come in, I'll let you go out again. So you're gonna vary it up. Okay, sometimes she's gonna get 15 pieces of kibble on the floor, 
when she comes in. Sometimes she's going to get a great game. Sometimes she's going to get a single treat. Sometimes she's going to do some sits and downs and get some treats. And sometimes you're just going to say, you are such a great girl, hugs and kisses, and then say, go ahead, go back out and play again. And in a pretty cool way, Mary, this one, John sent us a little video so we can actually oh. see her executing. Okay, that's great. Let's see if I can get here and see it. So it's a little bit hard for me to see, but what I think I am seeing is t a tentative, tentative. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm wanting to understand what she fe is feeling so tentative about, what her, what her association is about coming inside, because actually you're luring her in, and she's like, um, I don't think so. <laughs> okay. All right, and then, then it looks like it looks like a pretty good game. So the other thing I would do with her is to put her on a light line with you watching on a buckle collar, okay? Let her go outside, sniff around, and then say to her, Sadie, time to go inside. Just take that leash, pick it up, walk right inside. And once she gets inside the door, I would start putting treats in different locations. So the reward isn't always going to come from your hand, but it looks a little bit like a cat and mouse game. So I would do the other things I suggested as well as using the lead, because if you use the lead, then you're a little bit more in control. Okay. And again, when you're using that lead, Sadie, time to go inside. It's easy for you to get your foot on just very gently and sometimes just go out there. Uh, put your foot on the lead or pick it up and give her some treats and then drop the lead, take your foot off it, and walk back inside. So it doesn't always mean the same thing to her. Let's try these things and maybe you'll send us another video next week and let me know if you need any additional help on that. All right, Mary. Uh, the next question is, um, how long of a walk? Oh, go ahead. Is, I'm, I'm sorry, Terry. It is really helpful. Like, as best as I could see, it is really helpful on these behaviors for me to see because I, I it does give me a chance to um, look at the body, look at the facial expressions, look at what the human is doing a little bit, and it, it just adds more clarity, and I can be a little bit more definitive or certainly try to be for you. And okay, sounds good guys. So if you heard that, you can send us videos. John sent that video to us through the messenger in Facebook. So he sent it direct to our Facebook. Feel free to do that as well. Hello, our pugs bark and rush the TV whenever any dogs or other animals appear. How could we stop this behavior? Oh my goodness, aren't pugs great? They are such little characters. They are just a laugh a minute. So clearly they're taking charge of the TV. <laughs> um, okay, so what I would do is I would have leashes on them, okay, while you're watching TV. And if you have any inkling or you can set up a video for them where it's going to happen, the second the dog comes on, you're going to feed them treats by you. Okay, and so you're going to be hopefully more rewarding than the game on the TV. And then pretty soon you can uh, teach them a maybe a lie down cue or a sit on the sofa cue uh, with you and pay them for the behavior then. It's just a game and of course um, the two of them together make a little team. So it's a team play and it's Oh, so much fun. Okay, so uh, another question for you, Mary, is that uh, we're dealing with a four-month-old Golden. How long of a walk should we take him on? We usually do one two-mile walk per day. Is that too long? 
How old should he be before I start taking him on my runs and jogs? Well, really, to be honest with you, um, and this is a question you should speak to your vet with, but I know from my own and and um, and what others do is we really want to wait for the growth plates to close before we do any rogging, running or jogging with them, especially on a hard surface. At four months of age, you're in you're in the teething process, and the teething process makes everything, the entire animal, a little bit on the soft side. So we go through critical periods of development uh, at this time. One of them is the fears of knowns and unknowns. Another one is that the, uh, the physical form is more subject to physical injury because the body is drawing from itself to complete the teething process. And this is a big draw on the calcium levels. So two miles is a lot for a four month old puppy, especially if it is heavy boned. So I would certainly be splitting that walk up. And it's not to say that the puppy wouldn't want to do it. Um, it's just that if you can find a grass surface to walk on, I think that's better, but I would try to chop those walks up into shorter periods. That would be my recommendation, but I wouldn't at all recommend any jogging or walking until the growth plates close. And so depending on the size, you know, it can be anywhere from 15, 17 months. Again, I would be checking with your veterinarian on that. For our one-year-old Corgi, and with everyone home, we have to crate him regularly, but he gets upset and bored and chews the floor. We've tried stuffing Kongs, but he keeps eating the floor. What should we um, do? He's eating the floor of the crate? That's what I think, yes. Okay, so um, let's get a different type of floor in there. That would be number one. And number two, I would use his uh, meals in the stuffed Kongs, not just stuffing a Kong with other things so he'd be more invested in the chewing. And I would divide that up into several Kongs. The other thing that you might do is to consider an X-Pen. A crate is confining, of course. An X-Pen gives him a little bit more room. It also allows you to be more interactive with him. So. You can walk over to the pen, you can ask him for a sit, you can ask him for a down, you can teach him a trick, and he can feel like he's not so locked away. So a lot of times what we will do is to attach the X-Pen to the crate so that he has the crate as well and you leave the door open and then he has kind of more of a play area which would give you an opportunity for different activities rather than just the Kong. So you could get him some puzzles, that kind of thing. But you could probably get an X-Pen shipped to you from Chewy, um, Amazon, I would guess, would have it. So also, so I, I wouldn't think you'd have any trouble finding an X-Pen. That would be my suggestion, especially if he's um, a dog that's been used to being out and now with all of our restrictions, he's having to be more restricted. And teach him some things when he's out. Teach him some new things. So you use his brain. And run him around, hide his treats in the house, and teach him the fine game that we talked about last week. So then when it's his turn to be out, you can do some uh, more quiet games, but you can also do some more active games. Okay, and for our final question of the day, how do you balance training, consent and care, and grooming acceptance with a dog's medical needs? Carefully, judiciously. Okay, so um, I'm, I, I'm not quite sure exactly what that means. Not sure what that entails. Is there any more on that one, Terry? I have a little more detail for you. Um, if my dog had it her way, I would never touch her paws, eyes, and ears, but she needs eye drops, medications, paw and ear washes, and backlog trims 
to try and get her nails off the ground. Uh, I know what to do with a blank slate dog, but a dog who needs a large amount of health care that she already finds averse is new to me, and I don't want to skip on her care, but also don't want to overwhelm her. Right. So uh, I would probably leave the nails go at this time because um, she sounds like a very sensitive dog who may have had some unfortunate interactions before you got her. And so there may be lack of trust. And remember that the, uh, the front feet are the stabilizers and the hind feet are the mobilizers. So if we're trying to do nails at either end, we're compromising her feeling about stability and or mobility. So we have to think about that. So I would start with whatever it is that she finds to be the least offensive to build trust. And you might try a licky mat, or they come in a bowl as well, and the bowl has a sticker unit on it. So you can put it at uh, her head level on the refrigerator or a door or something. And while she's licking some peanut butter or her favorite treats on the peanut butter or whatever you choose to use, you can just be gently stroking her okay and trying to earn her trust about your hands i would move very slowly with this and then you can slowly get so that you can touch her ears and just give her a massage you also can look up some tea touch exercises to do with her to make her relax into the therapeutic touch and see if you can't get her to appreciate and earn trust and confidence doing that. I also would be trying to understand from the veterinarian what the root of the problem is. If you've got ear problems going on and eye problems, I'm wondering if there's an allergy of some kind, you might need to change uh, her food protein source to start maybe, or altogether something different. But I would go very, very slowly because in the end it will pay off. And um, that may not help you in the moment with the medicating, but I would go so far as to having somebody else do that part like for now because it will be very important in your relationship with her that she does feel trust and if she has to be medicated I, I think I would let somebody else just do it as quickly as can possibly be done and you're not involved I wouldn't even be there uh, and then I would be working hard on several short sessions a day multiple uh, to have her start to feel the confidence so that you can ultimately do these things yourself and that'll do it for Mary today. That's a goodbye for now for us. We'll do a little wrap-up, but first, let's hear from Mary. Say goodbye, Mary. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for supporting. And please stay safe and stay well. Okay, everybody, that's it for this week of Live with Mary Reamer. Uh, like Mary said, we are absolutely accepting video content that you can send to us of your dogs so we can get a better idea and can help you more. This show is here for you. Uh, what a good dog is here for you during this time, and Mary Reamer is definitely here for you as well. We'll see you next time. Please leave us some questions, those we didn't get to. We'll get to them next time. Thanks a lot. Is he on there still? He is showing.